and Addict. My name is Jimmy B. Man, thank God for Narcotics Anonymous, man. Thank God for the uh, programming committee, man, for asking me to come and speak. Don't know what I'm going to really speak about, man. I really don't. I just know that I prayed before I came up here and asked God to give me something to say to help an addict stay clean another day. Um, I want to take a moment of silence, man. I had a bad week. A friend of mine, I came to work Tuesday morning, man, and a real good friend of mine, man, uh, we was talking, and I stopped, after we had got talking in the break room, man, I walked down to my workstation, man, and uh, about a half hour later, man, uh, he had died in the break room. So, um, I'm a little emotional today, because it's the first time I didn't really kind of like shared about it. I want to take a moment aside. He wasn't really a member of Narcotics Anonymous, but he's part of God's family. You know, he was a godly man, and you know, and that's what this program is all about. It's a God-given program, and it's more than just the pe members of Narcotics Anonymous, man. If we don't carry this thing, uh, this message outside the rooms, what are we carrying the message for? So let's take a moment of silence, please. Oh, thank you, man. You know. Uh, and that's part of getting out of the trap of the self-centeredness, too. When we start thinking about somebody else other than ourselves, man, and quit being so selfish, you know, and, and being selflessness, man, that's part of what this program of Narcotics Anonymous teaches us, man. You know, this thing is bigger than just Narcotics Anonymous, though. You know, we learn the message, we learn to practice spiritual principles in this program, but we take it outside of this place, man. We, we are uh, a beacon of hope for a lot of people, man. We just don't know, man, that a lot of people see us not just as old dope fiends anymore, but as people that have changed their lives, have went from the self-centeredness to the selflessness of life itself, man. You know, uh, man, my story starts off, man, I started getting high when I was like about nine years old, man, and um, I got high for a lot of years, man. You know, the first time I ever used any mind altering mood changing chemicals, man, it was in uh, the summer of 1962. You know, a whole lot of y'all wasn't even born there, right? <laughs> but I, I remember, and I, and I said I used substance. I don't know if I got high that day or not. I know that uh, we was on the railroad tracks. We had stole some liquid dope from, uh, from my stepdad, and we went over on the railroad tracks, man, and, and we drank it, and we got diarrhea behind it, and I don't know. <laughs> I don't have the, I don't want nobody getting the visual because I don't know what happened. I don't know where we found toilet paper and all that other shit from, right? But I just remember the thought of, man, let's go get another one. You know, and from then on, man, and I might have got high a little bit earlier than that, but that's the, la that's the first time I remember. And the last time that I used any mind altering mood changing chemicals was September 11th of 1995. And I remember that day because I was sitting in the dope house and God has sent some angels dressed in SWAT uniforms, you know, to get me out of there. You know, and it was like, that's the last time I got, I remember when they came in there, I had tried to hide some dope on me and, cause I know I'm going to jail and I said, if I go to jail, I'm gonna get high in there. And, and you know, I, I'm, man, I don't know how, but they found the dope. Uh, you know, I don't even remember why I even hit it, it's been so long ago, but I remember laying in the cold concrete floor at Allen County Jail in Fort Wayne, Indiana, man, and crying out to God once again and making a final bargain with him, you know, that if you just help me to stay clean, I'll do what it takes to stay clean. Man, and I haven't gotten high since then. You know, I've been, I've been clean for over 18 years, man, and, and it's because I've escaped that trap of self-centeredness. You know, I've start practicing spiritual principles in all areas of my life. You know, um, I remember going through the, going through the, uh, the jail system and going to, going to the penitentiary, man, and we were sharing about something this morning about how the judge had sent me to six do three, and I was thinking about, man, I could have learned the lesson on a two do one. I didn't have to do the whole three years, right? And, and it's because, man, we think we know what's best for us, but God always has the, the, the master plan, right? And I remember, um, I remember doing it three years and I was scared to get high in there because uh, at the time, it, 
you had a dirty drop, they had got you with possession of, of a substance. So I didn't get high when I was locked up and met a whole lot of tra things transpired in them three years. Um, May the 1st of 1997, I had been locked up for a couple years and I was sitting in the day room of the, uh, outside the walls of Pendleton Reformatory. And I remember I'm watching the news and uh, they showed a picture of this young man talking about he had killed a couple of people and they were looking for him. And I, and I looked up at the thing and it was my son. And it was like, it was like, you know, the, the substance of my disease had me want my son to be just like me when I grew up. You know, it, it had me want him to do the very things that I had done because I didn't know nothing about incorporating those spiritual principles in my life. All I knew about was uh, active addiction to finding ways and means to get another one, you know, at all costs. And I'm sitting up there and I'm watching, I'm watching the news and I felt so powerless and, and, and I didn't want to go tell nobody because I was scared that they was going to take me to a maximum security, you know, because they might have thought I was an escape risk or something. And I just remember praying, man, you know, it's something about praying. It's something about asking somebody for some help. I'm talking about asking somebody, a God of my understanding, man, just to get me through another one, another minute. Another five minutes, another hour, another day. You know, it's something about praying, man. And I remember how powerless I felt, and uh, how I remember going back to going back to the bunk because we was in dormitories in, and just taking a blanket and just wrapping my head up, man, and and just crying and crying and crying. And uh, something happened that night, man. I mean, you know, when God started working on my self-centeredness. Man, and start getting out of me to help somebody else. Man, it's when I start getting some freedom in this program of Narcotics Anonymous. You know, I was sharing with somebody earlier about, about a half hour ago. They said, what you going to share about, Jimmy? I said, I'm going to share about the traps. Because every time we think it's one trap, guess what? It's another trap. And it, you know, ain't no, it ain't no bottom to the disease of addiction. You know, as some literature talks about the bottom is when we stop digging. You know, that's where the bottom is. But it's always, everybody talks about a trap door and a trap door and a trap door, and them doors continue to go down and down until you're ready to surrender. You know, and I was sharing with that, I said, that shit sound pretty slick, didn't it? She said, yeah. <laughs> I said, I think I'm going to share that shit. Because I, I, look, when I come up here to share, you know, one thing about sharing, you got to make people laugh as well as cry. You know, and the reality of it is, if you share your story, you got some funny shit that happened, and you got some real serious shit that happened. You know, my life ain't never been all serious, and ain't been all funny. But a lot of times, I'll laugh to keep from crying. You know, because my hurt and my self-centeredness, man, won't let y'all, won't let me tell y'all how I'm really feeling. You know, literature talks about hiding that shaky, insecure person on the inside. You know, and I do that a lot. But the reality of it is, man, I got a lot of freedom from this disease of addiction. You know, and I got it by working the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous. I didn't get it just because I came in here and started sitting in meetings. I didn't get it just because I got a sponsor. I didn't get it just because I just do what I do for service work. Man, it's a combination of all those things plus working the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous. No, um, man, anyway, after I got out of prison and, and, and I'm kind of like, I'm thinking about what I want to do because I'm thinking about, man, just if I could just give one sack and flip it, I could get my son out. And, and I'm going to tell you, man, this, this disease that we have, because I ain't the only one got it because y'all in this room too, right? Yeah. You know, the disease that we have will tell us some real serious crazy shit. Just get you a sack, Jimmy. You can get him out. You know, my son do 180 years. How many sacks do I need to sell to get him out? Shit, I ain't enough, I tell you that. Anyway, so I'm, I'm getting out and I go register for my pro and, and it's a guy that had been locked up with me a couple years earlier and, and he getting ready to do a fresh 20 man and he all nonchalant talking about, yeah, man, I'm getting ready to go do a fresh 20 ball. And 
I looked at him, I said, for real? He said, yeah, man. He said, you know, they called me, like, they, they called him again. And I said, man, it ain't okay to do no more time. Okay. It just ain't no, it ain't okay to separate yourself from yourself no more. Yeah. It ain't okay to be trapped in that self-imposed prison inside and outside of a real prison. You know, I remember the only time I could build a relationship with the God of my understanding is when I was incarcerated, though. Because when I was out there running the street, man, I didn't have time for God. And I tell people a lot of times, you know, when I, when I got out, they say, what's your secret, Jimmy? I said, you know, a lot of people, they go to prison, man, and the first thing they want to do is pick up a Bible, and they, they got God, and, you know, they, but as soon as they walk out that gate, guess what? They leave God in prison. I said, I brought him out of here with me this time. I said, this time, I wasn't going back. And it's been over 15 years since I've been incarcerated. We got a new justice center in Fort Wayne, man. It's been there about 10 years or something. I ain't never seen the inside of that place yet. From the inside or the backside. You know what I'm saying? Because I ain't never seen the, in, the front side of a lot of them jails. But I sure in the hell seen the backside of them. You know, I ain't never come through the front door. I always come through the Sally Port or whatever the hell they call that shit. You know? So, you know, it's like, man, after I seen the dude doing the Fresh 20, you know, God is due to him about some spiritual awakenings in this program. You know, but you have to be in tune with God to get those spiritual awakenings. You know, you just can't just say, okay, God, this is it. And God reveals some things because some things is too much for it to be revealed to us. You know, at any given time, man, you know, I want recovery overnight. You know, I want to escape this trap right now. But the reality of it is, man, I need to do some work. You know, I need to write on some steps. You know, I need to process those steps with a narcotics and I'm a sponsor. You know, and that's where the freedom comes in. At. That's where the real, you know, this program is so simple. Because I want to come up here and tell y'all, the only way to escape the trap of our self-centeredness, man, is work the steps, and that's it. You know, it's real simple. But we, I want to complicate it. I want to say, well, you know, if I live the steps, because I use, I use the literature as a two-edged sword, right? Yeah. You know, because I'll say, if I live the steps, you know, that's enough, because our literature talks about the message is meaningless unless we live it, right? You know, but the reality of it is, if I don't work the steps, how in the hell am I going to know how to live them? Right. Right. If, if I don't know how to incorporate some spiritual principles in my life, how in the hell am I going to know how to use those spiritual principles? Talking about being honest. You know, I, I had been dishonest all my life. And, and I remember when I was young, some of y'all don't know about them landline phones, right? <laughs> <laughs> Except for the ones on house arrest nowadays. That's the only time they use. Look, and now they didn't come out with that GPS shit. You ain't even got to have a landline phone no more. They have some shit for your ass, right? Anyway, I remember when I was like a young man in my, in uh, People would call him, my mother say, shh, tell him I ain't here. Tell him I ain't here. And I learned how to lie like that. Because if it was okay for me to tell him that she wasn't here, guess what? It was okay for me to do a whole lot of underhanded shit. You know? So I started learning how to lie. And then I come in the program, and Narcotics Anonymous, man, and y'all said, be honest. I ain't know how to even be honest. And I'm going to tell you, with 18 years clean, some days I ain't honest with me. I ain't honest with my feelings. You know, because a lot of times I want to still mask these feelings because of the pain and the hurt. But I don't mind letting y'all see me cry today. I cry real ugly, too. I'm ugly. <laughs> you know, I, I ain't no handsome guy to begin with, though, right? But I, you know, I'm one of the people that really cry ugly. You know, my, my face get all twisted up and shit. That's why I don't like to let y'all see me cry, right? But sometimes I just can't help it. Sometimes the feelings get so overwhelming. You know, they, they're so real. Man, it just, the shit just got to come out. Just like when I stood up here the first, when I came up here, man, and I felt a lot of emotions coming out. Man, this program of Narcotics Anonymous, man, to bring some shit out in the most inopportune time. You know, and I done, I done, I done been here since yesterday. I ain't even thought about crying or, or, or none of that. But the self centeredness of me said, you're a grown-ass man, Jimmy. You can't let them see you cry. But in, in order to escape this trap, 
you got to show some emotions that's that that's just not right for you, you know. So after I get out of prison, I see the dude, and I'm starting, and I start going to meetings. Man, some real powerful uh, spiritual awakenings happen in the meetings of Narcotics Anonymous. I'm talking about. I start going to meetings, and when I came out, man, I thought about thought about higher literature because I read the literature and I study the literature, and I said. You know, and I read in that part where it says a meeting a day for the first 90 days is a good idea, right? I said, well, if I meet 90 meetings in 90 days, that's a good idea. I, I'll be all right. So after 90 days, guess what? On the 91st day, I wanted to go to another meeting. Then on the 92nd day, I wanted to go to, once you start getting in the habit of doing some things, you know, it just kind of like comes natural. Then you start meeting people and you start kind of like, it ain't all about you no more. You know, it's about you helping another addict. That therapeutic value, man, is without parallel. It ain't nothing like it when we know how somebody's really feeling and they haven't even told us nothing. So I started incorporating these principles, man, and, and um, I started to kind of like going to meetings, man. I started learning people. And I was telling somebody last night, the first convention I came to was up here in Maryville in 2002, right? And I remember kind of like, so, so afraid of being around a lot of people and so, uh, so uncomfortable. Because this shit is uncomfortable when you get around people. It's like, you know, and I remember faking like my back was hurting. And I remember going back to the room and, and it was like, because I didn't know how to interact with other people on a level like this. I didn't know what conventions was about anyway. You know, I, I had been to other conventions for other jobs that I've had, but it ain't nothing like a Narcotics Anonymous convention when we stand up here and we give somebody some hope, strength, and experience. You know, the, the reality of it is, man, is when we come in here to these conventions, man, if we just come in here with an open mind, we'll learn something. And that's one of those spiritual principles that got me out of me, too. You know, it's all, every spiritual principle that we have can be incorporated into this escaping the trap of our self-centeredness. You know, the open-mindedness, man, it gave me a chance to see how other people live and how they can help me. Because when I came in here, I didn't even think I had a problem. I just thought maybe I just was so unlucky, I just got caught all the time. You know, I just thought that maybe I was the slowest guy in the bunch. You know, because there'd be a bunch of us, and I'd be the only one that got caught all the time. You know, like, shit, what's really going on? So, man, you know, I, and I started kind of like looking at the similarities and not the differences. You know, I, it didn't make no difference. You know, literature talks about diversity as our strength. And we came around the rooms of narcotics, anonymous man, and, and we got all sorts. But I know our literature and the, the, uh, Anne Marie was sharing last night, you know, thank God that we don't care what you got or what you don't have or who you use with or how much you use or how, how much you got or whatever. All we care about is what you want to do about your problem and how we can help. You know, and that's part of that selflessness that we have because we truly want to help people stay clean. We truly want to help people find a new way of life. Man, and that's why we do what we do in the rooms of narcotics now. We keep coming back, man. We keep sharing the hope, man, that one day they'll stay clean and they'll be standing up here at a podium speaking about how they heard somebody share one day, man, that all it takes is just a, a, a little bit of hope. And we start building from there. Man, just, just the ideal of anybody staying clean was real foreign to me. Because the people that I ran around with, man, all we talked about is who we gonna, who we gonna hit, how much we was gonna get, where we was gonna, you know, finding ways and means. You know, living to use and using to live. You know, and that's my, that's my story that's been all of my life, man. I never could get enough. I never, one was too many and a thousand wasn't never enough. You know, and, and the story goes, man, is that after I got out and started working some steps of Narcotics Anonymous with a Narcotics Anonymous sponsor, man, my life started kind of like getting a little better. I started learning how to interact with a group of people. Remember when I first went to my first camp out down in the Mid-State area. Man, it was like, because I didn't know nothing about living like that, because I've been, I've been raised in the ghetto. Everybody think I'm from New York or Chicago or someplace. But I'm from Fort Wayne. I've been there all my life, right? 
But I remember going to my first camp out down in the Mid-State area. I had some Stacy's on, and I was all dressed up. And they looked at me like, what the hell is you doing here with dress like that? Because I didn't know. I didn't know. You know, I, and man, it, and now I kind of got my sleeping bag. I got, I got the shit, right? I got the words. But it's because I've learned how to be open-minded about a lot of things. We didn't go camping when I was little. You know, when I was little, I was telling somebody the other day, man, when I was little, my first hustle was throwing rocks at cars and shit because there are a lot of street walkers in the neighborhood that I, that I was in, right? So they would get in the cars, and when, when they would uh, get the money from the guys, right, they would give me a signal, and, well, they give us a signal because it's about four or five. We start throwing rocks at the cars, right? So the lady get out, and, like she chasing us, right? You know, they get, the game, man, the game is so rough. And I, and I remember she meets around the corner, give us a quarter. I was about seven, eight years old then. This is the kind of life that I live, man. We didn't talk about going camping, man. We was talking about finding ways and means to get one more, even at an early age. You know, but it wasn't about the dope, man. The thing about this program of Narcotics Anonymous, man, the drugs is just a symptom of our disease. You know, our disease is way up here, right between these two ears, man, and it'll have me thinking some real crazy shit most of the time. But as I incorporate these spiritual principles, man, and I start finding out how to unlock the keys to, ha having the keys to unlock this self-imposed prison that I put myself in for so many years, man, you know, and I've only done it because I've learned how to escape the self-centeredness, man. The trap is real simple, man. If we unlock the door to the self-imposed prison, man, we can get some freedom. And I'm talking about the freedom to be who we truly are, who God had created us to be, the freedom to help somebody without asking somebody for something, without reaching your hand out for making them pay you for doing something that's already done. You know, God has some ways of working in my life, man, that has, has been real mystic to me sometimes. You know, real different from the light that I grew up, you know, living in. It's like, but I know it's only because I've surrendered to this program of Narcotics Anonymous, man. And I'm not doing no diff nothing no different than y'all can do. You know, one day y'all be up here speaking, man, because y'all haven't been clean enough or haven't got the message enough. One day everybody be able to do this thing, man. I don't have no monopoly on this. I learned this from other people. You know, I'm not shaky and insecure no more, for the most part. Every now and then I get crazy, right? You know, because this disease, man, is only arrested. You know, I just choose not to let it out no more. I just choose to keep it arrested. And I do that, man, through all the suggestions that I've been given in this program of Narcotics Anonymous. I've learned through this process, man, that the only way that I can escape the trap of self-centeredness, man, is to continue to apply spiritual principles in all areas of my life. You know, when I quit picking and choosing which ones I'm going to be honest in, when I quit picking and choosing which one I'm going to surrender to, you know, all the spiritual principles that's in the 10th step, man, I was reading that the other day, and I said, yeah, I'm going to share some of this profound shit. Because I still want to sound good, right? But the reality of it is, man, all of it sound good, but are we living it? You know, the message is truly meaningless unless we live it. You know, and I continue to live it to the best of my ability. I might not live it the way y'all want me to live it. Well, some of y'all might like that shit, right? Because y'all are doing the same shit, right? So if I do it and look good, y'all can do it and look good too, right? And that's the way this process worked, though. But it works only because I work it. Thanks for letting me share. Can we take a moment of silence uh, for the addict that may pick up for the first time, for the family members who still refuse to join us, and for the uh, newcomers in old time? Moment of silence, please. Thank you. 
My name is Lisa and I'm an addict. Hey, Lisa. I'm from Lake Borderline, that's Lake County, Waukegan. We part of Chicago land region. I want to thank uh, Isaac is Isnac, Isnac <laughs> uh, programming chair for asking me to come out here and share my experience, strength, and hope. I want to thank you, Jimmy. Uh, I, I too didn't come prepared. I don't never come prepared. Whatever come out, come come up or come out. I know that I carry a message of Narcotics Anonymous. Um, I always like to try to read something from the literature. I have found that you are just like me. I'm no longer better than or less than. I feel the real love and commodity in a fellowship. My great spiritual awakening has been that I am an ordinary addict. I am not unique. There are still those who refuse to join us to take the path that we have chosen. Because they feel they are unique, they may die. But may God bless them too. You know, my clean day is July 14, 1994. I have 20 years clean this July. Uh, my first time in the program of Narcotics Anonymous program. And I thank God uh, I, I arrived here when I did. Uh, we talking about the traps of self-centeredness, right? So look, when I got here, I was 22 years old. I had been to treatment six times. By the time I was 16 years old, I was a high school dropout, a teenage mom, and I was freebasing every day. And so by the time I came to Narcotics Anonymous program, I was seven and a half months pregnant again with my fourth child. And I remember my last run like it was yesterday, July 13th. And, I, and it was three o'clock in the morning. I had been up for five days. I had like maybe two or three dollars and I was finding means and ways to get one more. And, and at that point, uh, I sat out and I got a moment of clarity. They call it in here a spiritual awakening. Somewhere the light bulb went off and I sat down for a minute and I said, everybody can't be living like this. Because where I came from, everybody got high. I, it was a family affair. Right. I got high with my mama, my grandmama, and I bought dope for my daddy. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't know that there was another side, that there were people who had found my way out to our dilemma. I didn't know that. All I knew, I had been in treatment so many times, but this last time was kind of different. And I remember telling myself, everybody can't be living like this. And I said, God, help me. And I had a five-year-old child at the time, my oldest daughter. And I told her, I said, Mama going to the hospital to get some help. And I remember going to treatment. I didn't know what to expect. All I knew was that I was sick and tired. You know, and even today, clean, I don't want no more and I act like it. You know, so when I got out of treatment after being there 30 days and I finally gave birth, birth to my last child and I made a decision that either I was going to die, because I always thought I was going to die using. Right. I already right. told myself right. that this the hand I was dealt and this what's up, this I'm going to die doing it. And I remember them suicidal thoughts. I remember, you know, just going to sleep and the birds waking me up wishing I had died in my sleep saying, damn, I got to get up and do this all over again. Mm -hmm. I don't know about y'all, but we the only people that woke up broke but got high all day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Who do that? <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and I like Jenny, I like to have fun because for so long I held my head down. I didn't know how to laugh. I had so much guilt and shame, and I didn't know who I was when I got here. All I know is I didn't want to get high no more. And I remember when I left the treatment program, first of all, I, 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 it's like the greatest love affair. It, it's two main points that really stood out for me. My counselor asked me a question. I had never been introduced to narcotics. Now, see, back in the 90s, we didn't have a whole lot of women programs. We didn't have a whole lot of meetings in my area. I think we had maybe three meetings a week. We got three a day now. You know, that lets you know that how this fellowship has grown. You know, um, and she asked me, she said, well, how do you feel not using drugs for the rest of your life? I said, I'm cool. She said, you a damn liar. <laughs> I got mad at her, right? right. I said, how the hell she going to tell me I'm lying? So I, I, she said, I want you to go to, room, to your room and think about it. And for some apparent reason, y'all always went to treatment in the summertime. <laughs> always got locked up in the summertime, you know. <laughs> I don't know what was that about. So I went to my room and I thought about it and I had another spiritual awakening. And I began to cry and I got scared and I got angry. 
all in the rain or one minute. And I went down there because I wanted some clarification because seeing treatment, I still had a reservation what I know it to be now. I didn't know that then. And I said, wait a minute now, I've only had a problem with cocaine, you know, crack. You know, I, I didn't have a problem until I started messing with that, you know. I said, you mean to tell me I can't? I said, I, I turned 22 in treatment, so I was there at 21. I said, I just turned, I, I'm just legal to go in the bars, you know what I'm saying? I can't have no champagne. She said, nothing. I said, I don't like that. <laughs> I was married. I, I, I couldn't perform unless I was drunk with my husband. I couldn't do nothing unless I was under some move my arts and substance. And so at that point, I began to grieve my drug of choice like I had lost everything. Because I don't know about y'all, but I depended. I used and found means and ways to get more. I didn't know that that was what was happening when I took my first drug. I didn't know that was going to happen to me. As, as a little girl, even though I was born in a dysfunctional family, I still had some dreams. And several and on the line, I lost them, and all I thought about was getting one more. And so I left treatment. Another thing she told me, she said, make a meeting, and don't leave five minutes for the miracle happen. I said, okay, what that mean? You know. So I, I remember getting out, and, I, and, I, and my aunt had just completed and I thank God that y'all open the doors and that you only got to have a few hours or whatever clean to come to a meeting. And, and, and I remember telling my aunt, I said, you know, they told me I had to make a meeting. She said, I know what this NA meeting is because she had just got a treatment, but she was, she had used, you know, she was drunk. <laughs> she took me to my first night class and I was meeting drunk, right? She didn't look like it, but I smelt it. Right. <laughs> Cause see, I had to go live with her for a couple weeks before my bed. I, that's how humble I was before my bed became ready for the homeless shelter. And so I went to this meeting and I walked in here and some I just felt like I belonged. I didn't have to go to another fellowship. I didn't have to try all them other fellowships. And, and, and I went in there and everybody was laughing and glowing and just enjoying life. I didn't see that. Well, I grew up with a whole bunch of bitter ass, resentful, abused women. Women in my house was angry all the time, you know? And, 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 and I looked at them, and part of me got mad. And I'm like, damn, don't they, what they laughing for? Don't they know they can't get high no more? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and, and from, that's where my journey began. And so we're talking about self sentence right? So I didn't work steps because... I got a sponsor name only at first. I didn't work stuff because everybody was sharing the body. And they said, well, Lisa, you need to get a sponsor and work stuff. I, what motivated me to work stuff was my own experience. And the literature say, your recovery is your own experience. It was my life clean looking like my life using. And at that point, I said, I didn't want to be clean and crazy. Because, see, I don't know about y'all, but ain't no fun experiencing pain and you can't medicate. Right. Especially self-inflicted pain. Because life started showing up now. I got my kids back. I, I looked up. I'm married to a man I really don't give a fuck about. <laughs> How I get here. I married them high, you know what I'm saying? So uh, life, stuff started happening to me. And, and feelings started coming back. And I started thinking rational. And see, I didn't realize that I had a, a, a disease of addiction. I don't know about y'all, when I came to Narcotics now and I started reading the, the program, and they say, Lisa, you suffer with the disease of addiction. I felt a sense of relief. I'm like, damn, that's what's wrong with me? I remember all my life, people would say, what's wrong with you? Right. <laughs> Why you just, get, you know, what's, what's your problem? I'm like, shit, I don't know. <laughs> Give me one more, you know? <laughs> you know, I wasn't, I had to remember my own story. I wasn't an addict that took a hit and went home. You had to put me out. You had to come look for me. Don't you realize you got kids? Get your ass on. You know, you know. I wasn't an addict that that. Uh, okay, I had enough. I wasn't an addict that went to sleep. I was an addict that collapsed from exhaustion. Mm. Yeah. I, you know, at the end of my world, it wasn't fun no more. I was hallucinating. I was running from me in my house by myself, just crazy. Mm. I was seeing stuff. So smoking crack at the end of my road wasn't fun no more. You know what I'm saying? So when I got here, I got busy. And, and they told me, you need to get a sponsor and work some steps. After I realized that I was living clean and crazy, I said, you know what? If I don't change my clean, they will. Mm -hmm. You couldn't have told me in 94 
that I'd be coming up on 20 years clean. Because, right. Right. see, I had some reservations. And, see, I didn't know the difference between my will and God's will. I didn't have a relationship with God. Matter of fact, I didn't like him because I didn't know him. I didn't care to know him. I got introduced to my high power through working the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know that my self-will was that destructive, clean. Because, see, let me tell y'all something. I've been clean long when I use. I've learned some new self-destructive ways to kill myself without the dope. I'm talking about how the disease of addiction is so insidious, man, it'll have you knocking your own self off. You know what I'm saying? So I, I really had to get busy in the self working process and started realizing that Lisa, something is wrong with your thinking. <laughs> you know, when you look up, and, 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 man, you got, look, <laughs> my best experiences has came through relationships. Uh, and, and, cause I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't really see me until I was with you, you know? Cause see, it's real easy to say I'm working on something left alone. I can read a book. Look, I came up in here with no education. I'm working on a PhD. All right. Next year I'll be in psychology. Imagine that shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I, I can read. I can internalize by myself. Yeah, I ain't got no care to defects. I'm all this and all that, but let me come in contact with somebody and the vote at the area don't go my way. Right. <laughs> or, the, or the sponsor don't do the homework assignment I told her to do. Or somebody uh, voted me out at my home group. And I realized you still sick. <laughs> my sister told me that five years clean. She looked at me because she got clean right after me, right? And I used to argue with my mama. I see, my mother's behavior triggered me. It didn't trigger me to use, but it was just something about my mother's behavior that would trigger, that would bring out the worst in me. And she looked at me, she said, you just is sick. <laughs> she said, you ain't changed at all, Lisa. You just ain't using. She said, you still the self-centered bitch you was when we was little. I was like, woo. I got to call my spouse on that one. <laughs> And she was, tr it was the truth. See, the 10 step tells me that I can tell the quality of my relationships, the, the quality of my recovery by the quality of my relationships that's in my life. If people is running away from me clean, that's something wrong with that, Lisa. If you say you in a 12 step program and you working and you learning a new way to live and you still running havoc through people's lives, something wrong with that. And I no longer want to live like that. So it talks about in the third step that this is where my transformation started happening. I had to wait till I get to the second, third step right. And I remember my sponsor telling me, you know, you got a second step, you need to act like it. I didn't realize that, you know, Pete, you know, the saying was when I came around here was, uh, and Sandy was repeating the same mistakes uh, and expecting different results. Nas is repeating the same mistakes and knowing the result. You know what I'm saying? And, and so it, it, when, I, when I read the third step, right, and it says, so what exactly is self-will, right? It says sometimes it's total withdrawal and isolation. We end up living a very lonely and self-observed exist, existence. Sometimes self-will causes us to act in and to the exhaustion of any consideration other than what we want. We ignore the needs and feelings of others. We bear through t uh, tampling over anyone who questions our right to do whatever we want. We become tornadoes whipping through the lives of family, friends, even strangers, totally unconscious of the path of destruction we have left behind. If circumstances aren't to our liking, we try to change them, by any means necessary to achieve our aim. We try to get our way at all costs. We are so busy aggressively pursuing our impulses that we completely lose touch with a conscious and with a high power. Clean. I, 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 
I, I, you know, most of my experience, you know, I don't, you know, there's a talk about we don't care where you come from, who you use, what, what your connection are. We just concerned about what you want to do about your problem, how we can help. So I don't share a whole lot about what I did using. Because I did the same thing you did. And if I didn't, it's only because I didn't stay out there long enough to get to it. You see what I'm saying? So I talk about the similarities. So when I read this, I said, wow. You know, my children are 25, 21, 20, 19, and then I adopted one in the process. She's eight. And they got resentments based on shit I've done since I've been here. They ain't got, you know, they want young, you know, guilt ain't pimping me no more. So they want, I got to clean my daughter's fire. So they didn't, they, they, they didn't see the stuff that I did. They didn't, you know, I had mama in them, you know, that enabled me. But they got some deep-rooted anger issues based on stuff I've done since I've been in recovery. Right. So that just to show you that, you know, without my permission, life's still going to show the fuck up. Life's still gonna happen. It depends on how I deal with it, right? So I'm talking about self-centered in my recovery all my life because I was so afraid that I was gonna get high. I had to control everything, everybody around me, you know, because I was so afraid that I was gonna use, I was gonna end up like my mom. And to me, you know, I lost my mom when I had 11 years clean. May her soul rest in peace. Worst feeling I could ever have in my life. First experience, I don't know about y'all, we only got one mama. That was a new experience for me. Thank God I had the program when I caught now that I was able to deal with that. But um, I remember, man, you know, uh, you know, we talking about self-centered. I'm talking about, you know, uh, you know, doing some, you know, it, it was, you know, I feared being like my mom because she, to me, was weak. When I was growing up, she people took advantage of her, and 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 you can slap her, and she can give you her last dime, and and and, and stuff like that. And I remember being a little girl saying, "You know what? I ain't gonna be like that when I grow up." You know, so I had I loved men, but I hated them. You know, the seven step talks about that street mentality we come up in here with. You know, what I'm saying I'm gonna get you before you get me. I had some. The first step talks about them untrue belief systems that we come up in here with. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I had to control this, and, and I had to be self-centeredness, and I had to run this and do this and do that, and I was causing more harm, clean. And so it wasn't until I got to my fourth step where it talked about sorting through the confusion and the contradiction. And I realized that I was just like my mom. I just didn't have to make the choices that she made. Mm -hmm. That I didn't have to live the life that she lived. That this program has given me a new way to live. And I don't take advantage of it, man. I don't. I am so grateful to be a member. I am so grateful to be a member. I am so grateful for the open mindedness to allow somebody to tell me the truth about me. Because I remember one point in my recovery, I'm talking about, look, <laughs> he's talking about some stories, right? I remember my first six steps. See, it wasn't the fourth step that kicked my butt, it was the sixth step. I had like 52 character defects, right? <laughs> Denying them all, but living in every last one of them. I'm like, what? You know, I was angry. I became verbally and physically abusive. I was engaged, right? I remember pushing them down the stairs, throwing knives at them, throwing hot macaroni and cheese on them. I mean, shit was coming out. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I think at that time I had eight years clean. <laughs> 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 And, and, and I ain't seen nothing wrong with it. You pissed me off. This, this is the consequences. This is the result. You know, I didn't see nothing. I was, I didn't see nothing. I'm talking about working steps, having a service position, sponsoring women. You know, sharing honestly. You know what I'm saying? And I was, I was living like this, right? And <laughs> it wasn't until I called my girlfriend. I said, you know how I don't know about y'all, but see, some things is, is like an adverse effect. I remember getting high and sitting my daughter on my lap because she was so attached to me before she was removed from me. And I remember crying, saying, I don't want to do this shit no more. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about hitting the pipe and just crying, telling me I don't want to do this no more. But can't find a way out. And didn't, and didn't, didn't get clean till like almost five years later. And I remember acting and participating in self-obsession, compulsive behavior, and I could not stop. 
I'm talking about the disease had me by, uh, by the grips and I hadn't touched no dope. I don't know about y'all, but that's a fucked up feeling to have when you know you're doing something and you just can't stop. <laughs> and I remember calling my girlfriend. I say, why am I abusing him like that? Why am I acting like this? And she said, you got to apply the first step like you ain't never applied it in your life. <laughs> and see, Surrender talks about that we don't have to fight anymore. You know, the, 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 the program gives us our solution. And I'm like Jimmy, sometimes I, you know, I used to tell God, look, you can handle this and I can handle that. <laughs> and I, 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 was, I was such a risk taker clean that I said, you know, people said, well, you gonna do that? I said, yeah, but what about the consequence? I said, I cross that bridge and I get there. Right. See, I didn't never think about what would happen if I slept with a married man while being married. <laughs> I didn't think about how my girls viewed me because it was like, you do as I say and not as I do. I learned how to be a parent and a woman today of integrity in here. I don't do the things I used to do. I ain't, I, look, I ain't nothing like I was yesterday. Right. Thank God I don't look like the hell I've been through. None of us. You know what I'm saying? And so when I realized that I was continuing to cause harm clean, and I said, and I, I, had, I, had, I told y'all most of my experience came in relationships, right? I had a guy tell me, I said, you know, you my look, so I've been married three times and divorced three times, happily. <laughs> and <laughs> it's no fault of them, you know what I'm saying? It's like my last one, my sponsor was like, you gotta ask yourself what cared the defect walked you down the aisle. Cause it sure wasn't love. It probably was greed. <laughs> you know, so I based on my emotional volatility that the first step talks about, I make permanent decisions on a temporary feeling. You know, my emotions have caused me to be unmanageable. That's what the first step talks about, that inner personal unmanageability. When I get caught up in my feelings, I want to act out. You know, I want to do this to cause pain to you, but I'm really inflicting pain on myself. See, I learned all that here. You know, and so I told, my sponsor told me, she said, well, uh, you know, I, no, the guy told me I was, that's where I was at. You know, I'm getting old. You know, I, I, I came in, I did my 20s in here, my 30s. I'd be 42 years old this May. Mm. My son looked at me, he said, Mama, I remember when you was in your 20s. I said, yeah, I know, son, Mama. I ain't getting old, baby, I'm getting experience. I still can whoop your ass. <laughs> 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 I work out every day a week. Come on, try me. <laughs> you know, but my kids love me today. But I remember him telling me one time, I said, you know, you remind me of my ex husband you remind me of this dude I dated then. And, and he said, well, if I remind you all them, who was the common denominator in the relationship? You. I'm like, I said, okay. I said, you know what, I was. <laughs> and so I had to take a look at that. I said, Lisa, you know, you played, you, you was the common denominator in all in relationships. You know, and I had, that's when I started really looking at myself and examining myself and saying, you know what, the problem ain't the men, the problem is you. You know, um, your lack of boundaries. You know, um, the, the six step talks about compromising our spiritual principle. It already told me in the beginning that one is too many and thousands never enough. So once I compromise one, before you know it, I'm standing for anything. You know what I'm saying? And so if I don't start compromising with one, I ain't got to worry about it. Right, right. I remember being in treatment, they told me, Lisa, it ain't the second train that gonna kill you, it's the first one. And so I started really examining myself, and so this was another spiritual awakening. I had had a sponsor for 12 years, right? And somewhere in my, see, I don't know, I experienced, you know, the first step, look, I gotta go here, y'all. I'm product of religion, I'm sorry. It says, how can I tell my disease is active? When we become trapped in obsessive, compulsive, self-centered routine, endless loops that leads nowhere but to physical, mental, spiritual, emotional decay. Clean. And I remember experiencing a spiritual death, being complacent. You know, every meeting I went to, I, I found something bad about it. I got tired of hearing her share. I didn't want to hear my sponsorship. You know, I got tired of working steps. You know, I, I, I went to the convention. I was just, and I'm not a, I'm not an angry person. I really not. 
Y'all see me, I'm smiling all the time, right? And 13 years clean, I became a stalker. <laughs> I look, I had never done none of this. This is new for me. And the first step talks about that we'll find ourselves having issues and problems with stuff we ain't never dealt with using. And so I became a stalker right now. <laughs> That's what they told me. I was a stalker. You know, I was in denial for a long time. Right, right. You know, motherfucker, you ain't asking your phone, okay? I'm on my way. <laughs> and I didn't care what time it was. I would get up in the middle of the night dressed in black. <laughs> right. Uh, Two o'clock in the morning, drive 45 minutes, park my car a block away and tiptoe up the, high, the, the sidewalk just to see if his car was in the driveway. So my girlfriend said, well, what if it ain't in there? And then I would stay there, you know, right? <laughs> and I know I got to get up and go to work the next morning, right? Then I wonder why I got sleepless nights. Why I'm ganging all this weight and I'm so stressed and, and I ain't relaxed and I'm angry all the time because I'm doing this to myself. And I remember, I mean, I did that for six months, like clockwork. I would wake up at 2 o'clock, okay, time to go with a black, I would have a black outfit ready. <laughs> and so I had this sponsor, and I felt stuck. I felt stagnant, and I had been with her so long, and because I wasn't no newcomer. And, my, and this is no, 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 no uh, direct hit to no newcomers, but my sponsor say, stop acting like a newcomer. You got some recovery. And so I remember doing this last time, before I did the last time, yeah. my kid's yeah. grandmama asked me, she said, she said, so I, look, I was going to marry him too. <laughs> she said, so how's the engagement? And I just started to cry. And she said, oh, my God, what's wrong? And I said, whatever got a hold on me when I get out of this one. God help me. You know what I'm saying? And see, it ain't them yet that I'm worried about. It's them damn again. You know what you tell me? I'm here again with all this damn recovery and step work and working my ass. I ain't working my ass off to get to my next hit. I'm far from it. You know, my disease, right, should have killed me with the drugs and active addiction. He trying to kill me with something else. You know what I'm saying? And so I said, I'm here again. You know, and so I, I, I was riding up there, and I called my girlfriend, and I started crying. I said, I'm on my way again. She said, Lisa, you got to stop this. You're going to kill yourself. You're going to drive yourself insane. Mm -hmm. And I remember crying. I'm talking about something had a hold on me. And I said, man, if you get me out of this one. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about, I ain't talking about, no, I'm talking about 13 years. And, and I stopped. And I start to recover in that area. And I changed sponsors because I wanted to move forward in my spirit. I was stagnated. My sponsor, who I had had for 12 years, her life, I, I tell you one thing. I own my own business. <clears throat> I just started my own business. I work. I'm, uh, I'm done with all my courses and all, my, all that stuff for my PhD program. I'm in the process of writing my dissertation. I got five children. I have a granddaughter. Uh, I'm in a relationship, uh, friendship. We trying to build a relationship with friendship. <laughs> I I told you I got areas of that. I sponsor women. I make meetings regularly. I do step work regularly. And I still, my life is never too busy where I cannot show up for not cause and not. Where I cannot, not just show up for y'all, but show up for me. Shit, sometimes, you know, like I tell people in my home group, this ain't, I'm, this ain't no direct hit to newcomers, but the fifth tradition tells us that the message is not just for the newcomer. It's for an any addict. And sometimes in my head, I'm the only one sitting in there with the clean time. Because everybody else life and got so busy that they can't come to me. And when they come to me, they don't want to share honestly. Everything is hard. Every, oh, I'm blessed and highly favored and all that shit, right? right. Well, why are you still coming? <laughs> you just as sick as me. Tell the truth. You know, I didn't come in here to save my face. I came in to save my ass, save my life, right? 
So my sponsor life had got so busy that I didn't see her in me. It's imperative that I see my sponsor in me. It's imperative that my sponsor's connected to service work. You know what I'm saying? And I looked up, she wasn't making meetings. I, you know, uh, she was sponsoring all these women. She wasn't in service work, and she said, well, I ain't got time for this. And I said, well, you know what? I got to move forward, because I feel stagnated. Because your sponsor can only take you as far as they willing. They think they went. Right. And clean time don't equals recovery. I learned that through my own experience. But you got to get some <laughs> to get some recovery. So let's not knock the clean time. Because that would be the first thing they say in my area. Clean time don't equals recovery. Whatever. Get you some and say that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It takes a lot of commitment, <laughs> perseverance, and courage to stand here with 19 and a half years clean with the shit I've been through. You know what I'm saying? And so I had changed sponsor. And I thank God I made that decision for me. It wasn't, I, I didn't give a fuck if I hurt her feelings. I didn't care if she got mad at me or none of that. I had to do what I had to do to save my life. I was dying. And so I changed sponsors, right? And it was the best thing. I got the best sponsor in the world. I've been with her eight years now. And one thing that that woman told me when I was driving up and down that highway, <laughs> when I was a stalker, <laughs> uh, she said, Lisa, it's two things. And I'm going to tell you, it's only certain people, women I sponsor. She said, I had 14 years clean. She said, you got 14 years clean. Your recovery must look like that. She said, I'm going to hold you accountable for your behavior. See, the 10 step says that I can no longer continue to blame my shit on the disease of addiction. At some point, I got to take responsibility for my behavior. I ain't believe, you know I'm an addict. What that mean? Excuses. It's, it, it tells us right there in, in the 10th step, we can no longer blame my disease on the things that I do, we do. See, I know better now. I got some tools and some spiritual principles in my life. I've worked steps. I work steps. You know what I'm saying? So I can't continue to say, you know, I remember she told me one time, she said, well, why are you doing that? I say, uh, well, you know, when I was five years old, <laughs> you know, I suffered from abandonment issues and abuse issues and so on. So she said, Lisa, how many four steps you done? Right, right. She said, Lisa, don't you have a therapist? I see I got the same therapist I've been with since I've been clean. She said, when you gonna let that shit go? <laughs> when you gonna let that fire you? When you gonna let that go? Why you keep holding on to that? Because I needed something to keep me angry. I needed something to justify my self this behavior. And it's easier for me to be mad at my daddy than to be the grown-up girl and say, look, mm -hmm. I apologize for my part in our relationship. For telling you when my mama died that my daddy died too. Not realizing how that affected you. But I wanted you to feel the pain and the hurt I felt because you was not there for me. But instead, I hold on to a 20-year-old resentment. Your ass be dead and gone. I'm still mad at you. That's it. You know what I'm saying? So I'm learning. I'm, I'm currently in my ninth step. And, 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 and my sponsor was so proud of me because she said, I'm so glad that you put yourself first on the list. Because sometimes the best amends that we can make to ourselves is, is the best is to ourselves, right? Because I realized that some of the things that I was continuing to do was because I had not forgiven myself for those things. That I was still holding myself hostage for the things that I have done in my past, in active addiction, in early recovery, and in sometimes today. And so I've been procrastinating on my nice step right because I truly, truly not only want to say that I've forgiven myself, I want to act like it. Like my father was always on my A step, but let that nigga call me. <laughs> Ignore. How dare he? Ignore. I don't care if you had hip surgery. I'm not coming over there and you stay two blocks away from me. Ignore. You know what I'm saying? And then my sponsor said, you know what? You are passing up a wonderful opportunity to have a good relationship with your father because you mad at some shit that happened 20 years ago. <laughs> you know the stuff we tell ourselves? 
how the disease of addiction keeps us trapped and loaded. And I, like you talked about, the self-made prison, clean. And I had to let that go. And my, and my, I'm my father's only girl. And he told me, he said, I apologize. He made his amends to me. And so we got this relationship now. We got a good relationship now. He don't do nothing for me, but he do something for my kids, right? I ain't giving you nothing. It's the kid's sign. But I'm saying that to say my ninth step is real vital to me because I don't want to keep placing myself in situations where I continue to cause myself the same pain. You know how you see the wall, but you just keep hitting it? You know? You know, I, I mean, I, I, I know, you know, people I work with may not see the wall, but I know the wall hurt. You know, I just keep hitting it. My sponsor said, why do you continue to knock at pain door? And then sometimes, check this out, here's the here. I set my own self up for a reason. I put these expectations on you. I know your ass can't meet. But I expect you to. Why, Lisa? You know, why? People say unrealistic, and that's what the literature say. It say don't have none. I can have some expectations, but I can't expect my 19-year-old son to act like a grown man. He's 19. You know what I'm saying? So I have to, I got to meet him where he at. And sometimes in my relationships, based on who you is, I judge you on your clean time. I judge you on who your sponsor is. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you in the meeting cross talking, you got clean time. Shut your ass up. Go out there the hallway. way. You know what I'm saying? We we trying to save our lives. This ain't socialization time. You know what I'm saying? And I judge, you know, on it. You know, and, <laughs> and and I understand that like the six steps say that when we see someone acting on a character defect, how much pain that caused because we once been there. I don't know about y'all, but in the beginning of my recovery, I used to walk hand in hand with my kid to defect self-centeredness, right? I didn't care if I cuss you out. I would cuss you out and tell you not go call your sponsor on that. <laughs> I did, and didn't care. Right. Work a step, nigga. <laughs> right. First, matter of fact, you're powerless <laughs> using literature to beat somebody up. You know, and as I mature spiritually, and I start to look at me, because while I'm in the meeting talking about you, and he this, and he that, and she this, and she that, what you think they looking at me? Say, well, you, you, what's wrong with you? You know, so I started looking at me, because see, water seeks its own level. I attract what I am. <laughs> if I continue to attract people that's emotionally unavailable, what that say about me? If I continue to attract people that's needy, what do that say about me? You know what I'm saying? I don't want the newcomer to look at me with all my clean time and say, I don't want what she got. Yeah. That's messed up. Okay, that's really sad. So, I no longer consciously <laughs> participate in self centeredness <laughs> routines, right? It, it gets me nowhere. I understand that I have to meet people where they are and I got to give myself a break. And that if I fall down, I just get back up. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm going to tell this story. I ain't going to tell my teacup story I always say. I'm going to tell a different one. I remember this boy, his father, he had, uh, his father, his son asked him a question. And his father said, well, son, you have two wolves that lives in you. You got one that wants to kill you, that wants to destroy you, and don't want to see nothing good in your life. And then you got another one that wants you to make it and, and, and live productive and spiritual principles and all that. And the son said, well, well Father, which wolf win? He said, whichever one you feed. And so I want to thank y'all for allowing me to come out here and share my experience and hope my name is Lisa and I keep coming back. Uh, we're going to form a circle.